Thank you for indulging my humor and having a good time. Uh, we need to have a good time in church. Worship. Do not let the world, the flesh, or the devil steal your worship. You know where you are spiritually by how your worship is. And if, uh, and if you're so aggravated and so worried and so fearful about anything else in life, then somebody's stolen your worship. We're here to make a statement. Amen. We're making a statement that says, God is on the throne, God is in control, Amen. I'm okay. Amen. So let's worship Him. How do we do that? In spirit Amen. and in truth. Worship God. Spirit and in truth. So God made us, created us to worship. And if we're not worshiping God, then we're not working, working properly. Okay? So let's, let's look in uh, Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 1. Psalm 8, verse number 1. The Bible says, O Lord, O our Lord. Uh, isn't that a good statement that somebody needs to put that on a shirt or a bumper sticker? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. See, that's what we're doing. We worship God. We're shutting Satan's mouth and the unsaved because they can't enter into that. They don't comprehend that. It doesn't make sense to them, and it scares the devil out of them. So that's enough reason to worship. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, your creation, you, you created it, you created the glory of it, you created the spacing of it, everything. I... Uh, the, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the sons of man that thou visited him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast Put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, all the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Verse 4 is our thought this morning. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? Heavenly Father, we stand here as needy creatures. We're saved, Lord, many of us. Uh, if not, people need to come to Christ today. But, Lord, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the opportunity to work for you and to worship you today. Most important thing to you and should be to us, the focal point of our week should be the time of worshiping you in spirit and truth. So, Lord, help us to see a truth today. Uh, Lord, and answer this question, what is man that thou art mindful of him? We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> when, we, uh, when we read the Bible, you know, we, 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 uh, we observe truths in this life. We do that by looking at our own lives, our successes and failures. We look at the lives of others. We see that by dealing with people, and personally, uh, I, I do it. Uh, understanding a doctrine or a teaching, I have a starting point. And the thing that uh, actually last Thursday, it just kind of clicked with me at the Upper County meeting, uh, church service, uh, it just kind of, the Lord just spoke to me about this thing of, this scripture and, and, and how you could perceive the scripture. Uh, what is man that you are mindful of him? And David is, is looking at the stars 
He's looking at the glory of God's creation. And he's saying, in essence, the magnitude and the beauty of creation does not get the recognition that, um, that man does. In other words, the heavens were made for man to view and man to explore. If you think that God is surprised that uh, China and the United States are fighting over ownership of the moon, <clears throat> they put their <coughs> flags down. There's gazillion, plenty of moons for everybody. There's no end to it. And it, it, it speaks of God's eternal existence. But there are limits that we don't know. We don't even know what we see let alone what else is out there. Space doesn't stop somewhere that we can get there in light years or whatever, and we've got telescopes out there, and it's going to be interesting what they find, uh, but there's no end to it. And it's not like it ends and there's darkness because darkness in itself is a, is a thing, is a creation. It goes on and on and on, and man cannot comprehend <clears throat> the eternity of God, the vastness of space, and God knew and God created within us a curiosity. That's why Captain Kirk, <laughs> many years ago, set out on the Starship Enterprise <laughs> to investigate. He didn't know there were Klingons there, he didn't know what he was going to run into. And uh, man's trying to make that uh, a reality. But here's my, here was my starting point. And it, I guess being at Upper County, the people there, it kind of looking at man. Shelley knows the joke's coming. <laughs> <clears throat> and the thought just come to me, we're really vile creatures. Vile creatures. Um, I'm just conscious of that. I, I see it within myself. I said, if our thoughts during this week could be expressed, if we could, if we could see a tape played uh, of just this past week of not just the Independent Baptist Church, we're the cream of the crop. We got the best preacher in town, maybe in the whole state. I tell people that all the time. They don't know how to take it. Number one. I've been voted number one. Spread that around. But we're, we're, we're messed up. When I, I, I guess when I think about the greatness of God, and I think about the love of God, and I think about the expanse of God's creation and all of this stuff, uh, I look at God. And I, and I think... Why? But David is saying something a little different, but I want to belabor the point of what started me on this, this concept and what I was going to say and spend more time on this morning sort of changed. We're vile creatures. Do you know that we're totally depraved? Why else would people come in 35 minutes late to a worship service? Total depravity. <laughs> I said, <laughs> we're vile creatures uh, and we believe in the total depravity of man what does that mean it doesn't mean that everybody is as bad as everybody else certainly not but it means that we have human beings have nothing within them to spark them or to move them to holiness it, we can't evolve to that. We can't create a utopia where there's no crime and no, and no uh, wrongdoing. We are going to do wrong. Man's going to do wrong because uh, so, we're totally depraved. That's the first thought that I had. Uh, man fails. Ever failed? I haven't personally, but I've met many people that have. We fail. 
and we don't achieve a lot of times what we, in some area, we may achieve in other areas, some areas we just don't reach our potential. We waste our time. And, and man is unfaithful. Holy cow, we're unfaithful. When we compare the faithfulness of God and the time, we don't, you know, if we treated our husbands and wife like we treat God, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be around each other too long. I mean, can you imagine? I got mad at my wife one time, and I didn't speak to her for three days. Was it three days or a long week? It was a long time. And she just got real upset. She said, are you not going to talk to me? Don't look at me like that. Y'all are worse than me. <laughs> I was so mad at her. I can't even remember now what she did, but it had to have been terrible. I only did that one time in my life. I've tried a little bit of everything. I'm not speaking to her, yelling at her. But then I saw how that was making her feel, and I thought, I just won't say anything. Well, that was, that was mean. I wish I wouldn't have told y'all that. Use this stuff against me. I hate you. So, <clears throat> man is unfaithful. You, God can't depend on us. <clears throat> no, he can't depend on us. Like he wants to 100% of the time. Man is forgetful. Man's forgetful. We don't tell God we love him like we should. We don't spend time with him like we should. We don't get in the book like we should. And we and sometimes we live a, a just a sorry life. And thank God we're saved. But if our, if our salvation depended on our works, nobody in this church would make it to heaven. Certainly not me. If, if the salvation depended on the works of any church in this town, especially the Presbyterians, <laughs> none of them would make it in. Man is forgetful. Man is undependable. And I started with that. And I was going to spend this morning just talking about our depravity. The Bible says, why well, I'm on that subject. The Bible says that the, the human heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Boy, we got we to gotta humble ourselves down. We're terrible. We're, now, I know a lot of you say, I'm, I'm not as bad as Mark Berry. I know where I stand. Yeah, I know you do. But then we read, but God who is rich in mercy. So understand, you want to worship? You want, I, if you're out, in, I think about people out in the cold and the rain. I used to worry about the homeless. And there's places where the homeless go. And then I got invited to a homeless camp there beside Starbucks before they kicked them out. They had a tent. They had a heater. They had tons of sleeping bags. And they were cooking a steak. <laughs> they invited me to a steak dinner. I didn't wow. eat, but... And I'm thinking, homeless is the way to go. <laughs> Oh, yeah, by the way, they started, the state says, can't call them homeless. Call them street dependent. And I'm thinking, okay, good, we don't have to help them no more then. Street can help them. I used to worry about them, but there's a lot of people in this world in a mess. There's people out of work that want to work. Unemployment's ran out for a lot of people. There's some people, I talk to these people, they're, they're hurting. They're hurting. They don't know how they're going to get through a week. And it's that way normally anyway, but now it's, it's just really bad. So we're helping who we can help. We're helping more people now maybe than we would normally, but we've got to do that. It's going to inconvenience us. Yeah, it's going to hurt us. It's going to aggravate us. Right, that's how it's supposed to be. 
But I want to look at this thing the way David. That's how I started out. And I mean, I get sick of myself. I really do. I just get sick of myself. I look inside and I see, man, I need to be living for God. I need to be sacrificing for God. I need to be loving God. I need to tell Him I love Him. I need to spend more time with Him. <clears throat> That's kind of how sometimes we view ourselves. But let's look at what David's talking about. David said, look what God made, but we're more important than that. You see, why does God love us? Have you asked yourself that question? I know you've heard this preach. Why did God so love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Why? Look at the depravity. Look at the uh, male trotter. Was, my preacher used to talk about him was a famous evangelist years ago. And male trotter was drunk. And what brought him to God, he got to the point where his, uh, he stole or took his baby's shoes and he sold them to get a drink of liquor. And when he was faced with the depth that he had reached, when he looked at himself and he saw, that's bad, I'm a bad person, then there was hope for him. And he came to Christ. And by the grace of God, he got off the booze. You know, you can do that. If you're on drugs, you can get off of them. If you're drinking alcohol, you can get off of them. If you're smoking cigarettes, good luck. <laughs> that was funny. So what is man? What has got, you know, Satan says we're trash. And we say, yeah, yeah, without God we are. But when David says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Why is God mindful of us? The most important thing going on today, this day, in all the world, are the churches where the man of God is preaching the word of God. And where people are singing and where people are worshiping and lifting up their voices or lifting up their hands or lifting up their hearts to praise God. Amen. That's what's important to God. Amen. What's going on in the world doesn't really matter. It comes and goes. But we have to protect our worship Amen. in our homes, in our churches. God looks at us, and what God sees, you know, you, you, we have kids. And some of you, you have, go in, you have a little baby. Those babies are going to grow up, and they're going to find dirt and mud. They're going to put nasty things in their mouth. It's a miracle that they even live. And if you don't cover up, the, the, the little electrical outlets are going to shock themselves. I've seen people go nuts on that, where they put a covering on that and put a sign, do not touch it. danger of electrical shock. I mean, you know, try to protect their kids. And they'll get muddy. They'll get dirty. I see kids, and they're just nasty. And I tell their parents, hose them down. That's my... That's my go-to phrase. Hose them down. I watch Hannah feeding the twins over there. We can't, we're not allowed in the house. We are the outdoor grandparents. So we get to stand and look in the window. It looks pretty weird to people that are passing by. I'm sure that, especially if it's me by myself. Here's that crazy guy again. But she feeds them, and, and they get that stuff all over them. And I'm like, I can't, like, don't, I don't want to be around no nasty baby. <laughs> but you clean them up for church. I'm, look at sweetheart, you're paying attention now. Look at her. That is a her, ain't it? Yes. 
Oh my God, yeah. Too pretty to be a him. But they get muddy, they get out there, get in the mud. They get dirty. But you know what that baby's going to look like when you get it in a little tub and wash it. You know the worst experience my kids ever had was when they were little and my mother washed them. She did it with a vengeance. And she had this song. She wouldn't, they were little. She'd put, it scared Kathy to death. She'd put them in the kitchen sink when they were just little brats. And she'd wipe them down as fast and furious as she could. And she would sing this song. Do, 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 do. And the kids just in shock. I mean, she'd be done in seconds and then hose them down with cold water, I guess. But you know what that baby's going to look like. And God knows what his baby's going to look like. When he looks at us, he sees something within us that we don't see within ourselves. We may see it in other people. We see sacrifice. Isn't that an amazing thing? What a, what a crazy concept. That Christians would sacrifice. What if there was one pew that was uncovered here? This magnificent. I don't know who picked this color out. This is fantastic. <clears throat> I think I'll let somebody else do that in the new church. But <clears throat> what if there was one pew that was just wood, had splinters in it, and we were full, and somebody had to sacrifice, said it wouldn't be Jerry. I'll tell you that. Because he looked like he's sitting on splinters now. <laughs> Who would sit there? We had, where was it? We had a visitor right over here. We had a visitor and they sat in somebody's seat in our little church. And a person came and said to them, you're sitting in my seat. I was so embarrassed. It was horrible. If they're sitting in your seat, move. How, how unchristlike. I felt horrible and I thought I better make a joke about it. And this true story, they went back and was looking at the mission board. And I walked back and I said, excuse me, you're standing in my spot. <laughs> and they laughed. I had a, happened to a preacher in North Carolina. He went and, and he, he was a visiting preacher and he sat on a pew. He didn't know. And somebody chewed him out for sitting on his pew. How Christ-like is that? How about, how about in honor, preferring one another? Amen. Let somebody else get the glory. Lift up. What, it's called Christianity. Interesting concept. Let's try it this year. <laughs> Christianity, like Christ. Little Christ. And I don't like it when I'm not that way. I don't like myself when I'm not that way. When I'm bothered, when somebody needs help, somebody uh, not here at the church, but somebody uh, we've been kind of visiting, I really want, I really want to help them. And they're in jail and they just got moved to Portland. And mom called me or texted me last night and said he wants to call you tomorrow. And I'm thinking, Sunday morning, eat, take a nap. If he calls me, I'm going to have to give up my nap. That's a serious thing. That's a sacrifice. And I said, well, if he, you know, we got a lot going on on Sunday. I didn't mention it was a nap, but <clears throat> I said, if he wants to call any time, it'll be fine. So I'm going to wake up perky, have my wife talk to him. <laughs> Can you imagine the Lord having the audacity to ask me to give up my nap on Sunday? Wow. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Remember that guy, Art, you took to... He had some kind of eye surgery. Yeah. <laughs> and Art took him to Seattle. <coughs> and he got to eye surgery. And the doctor said, you can't come back the way you came. 
Because at the higher elevation, right, it put pressure, pressure on his eyes. You got to go around. So like four to six hours later, he had to take a shortcut through New Mexico almost. <laughs> How many hours was it? <laughs> Ten hours. And knowing Art, I'm thinking, oh, he's going to be ticked. And he wasn't. He won't do that again. <laughs> if it had been me, the man would have went blind because <laughs> I'd have brought him back the way that he came. Ten hours. God knew that. And one of the few times, Art came through. He knew he could count on him. We've got a hero in our midst. You can kind of tell what we're willing to do for other people because God loves them. Some people I can't love. I'm sorry. There are some people it's hard to love. Come on. But when I think about I'm doing this for God, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I can love them. I'll love them for Jesus. Man is divinely prepared. What is man that are mindful of him? Man is divinely prepared. He's made in the image of like and likeness of God. God made us like himself. Uh, we possess a body, soul, and spirit. I love dogs. I love my dogs. I love my pets. I don't know where they're going to go. I'm supposed to be writing a book on that, and I'm having a hard time. I want to write a book on that, how God gave us pets. It's not an accident that they wag their tail. It's not an accident they put up with us. It's not an accident that they love us. I visited a man a while back and his cats. He lets them up on the table. He feeds them. They crawled all over my coat. And he's watching me see if I'd get mad at him. I said, Tom, I love your cats. That was cat, wasn't it? You got cats in dogs. And he's good to them dogs. Can I tell him about the rafters and the bicycle? You sure? Never mind, I won't. <laughs> We're made in the in the in, in the uh, I'm almost done. I gotta get through this. Okay, the image and likeness of God. We possess a body, soul, and spirit. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're not another animal. We're not another animal. We are spiritual. We have a connection with God. My dog sometimes look like it's praying. Matter of fact, what was the guy's name? He was a retired preacher. He lived in Alaska. And uh, he married a lady here from the connected with the church. What was what's his name? They live right uptown here. Uh, anyway, we went to visit him, and uh, oh, I can't remember their names for nothing. But she got Alice. saved, huh? Alice. 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 And she got saved, and I'm not kidding. My wife was there. And while we were praying, we were standing in a little circle, and he was here, she was here, my wife was there. And I, I, I just felt a presence. This note, I'm not exaggerating or lying. I looked down and their chihuahua was standing on its hind legs, not leaning on anybody, with its head like this. <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm, what if he's getting saved? <laughs> I guess they trained him to do that. I hope they trained him to do that. And uh, it was pretty amazing. But their chihuahua was there in reverence. But I guarantee he wasn't conscious of God. All he was thinking about is that treat he's going to get for standing like that. And Alice got saved. The dog, I don't know. I, it almost convinced me that a chihuahua could get saved. I never would have thought it. But an animal can bow its head like it's praying, and they give God glory 
And I don't know what within their instinct that they're aware of with God, but nobody's like man. As sorry as we are, as low down as we are, Christ died for us. That makes us important. Man is divinely prepared. Man is uh, divinely positioned. God gave us dominion over the works of thy hands and put all things under our feet. And somebody said, we've even conquered electricity and fire and elements in nature we have made subdued to serve us. We heat our homes. We light our homes. And God may give us dominion over space. I don't know. Man is divinely protected. Man, God, you know what? You're not, especially if you're serving God, you're not going anywhere that God gets done with you. My, I've mentioned this before, my grandson is obsessed, and I never think about it. I'm only 68 years young. But my grandson in Houston, nine years old, Jansen, is obsessed with how much longer I've got. <laughs> and he has given me an expiration date. He's researched it, and he's given me. And so every time I see somebody on the news that's famous, that's younger than me and dies, I send it to him. There was one guy who was 107, and I sent that to Jansen. I said, there you go, buddy. And I thought about finding nine-year-olds that bit the dust and start worrying about that for a little bit. But I thought, no, it might be a little mean. But he can't process it. And, he, and he's thinking, I, you know, I, I don't want to go today, but there's going to come a time I'm more and more and more ready to go. There's nothing else. To, I've seen it all. I, the only thing I've experienced new is things with God. Amen. So that's like moving from North Carolina here or here to Hawaii. It's another real place that we're going to go kicking and screaming. <laughs> and then we're going to open our eyes in heaven. <laughs> oh. Oh, this ain't so bad. The God that created this earth created right. our place. Amen. We see that the in insignificance of man is compared with the amazing universe. But the dignity of man is disclosed by the gracious visitation of God. We have dignity. It doesn't matter if you get old. It doesn't matter. It's funny how you get older and you're less important to people unless you got money. Hold on to your money. That's a way to be important. At least make them think you got money. And that's how to keep your grandkids and your kids in line. Oh, you laugh and you know it's true. <laughs> got a bill or two. Yeah. <laughs> Then, then you're important. But we're important to God. We've got a reason to get up every day. We've got a reason. to. We're working for God Almighty. Amen. Jehovah. The same one that Jacob the deceiver became a prince with God. We preached about that. Same one that Abraham served. Same one that Paul served and talked to. And Peter and James and John. And we're part of that now. Man, we got to be conscious of that. We are great value to God. Even Peggy Burline <laughs> is important to God. And I'm thinking, if he says I'm important, if he says I'm a value and one day he's going to put us on display in heaven, I tell you what, I think pretty highly of myself spiritually. I may be a lump of clay, but God is living inside me. Amen. And he's living inside you. And if you're not saved, you'd, you'd be a fool. You'd be a fool to put that off. 